Hi, everybody. This is Pastor Alex Lepos of the House, Montreal, Quebec, Canada. We welcome you to our Bible study. Those of you that are here tonight and those of you who will be listening during the week after I post it. So we're going to begin with prayer, and I'm going to ask Mark Zarbatani to lead us. Mark. Father, we thank you for this time together. And as we unfold your word tonight, I just pray that truth um, be expounded in our minds and our hearts and through our pastor. Father, we thank you for we thank you for life. We thank you for health. We thank you for a relationship that we have with you. And Father, now we give back our attention. We give back our minds. We give our commitment to you. And Father, help us to glean something that will sit with us and last with us for as long as we live. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So tonight we're going to be doing something a little bit different, although Christina says I've done it before, but probably not the way I'm going to do it tonight. We're going to be looking at Psalm 19. Psalm 19 has been called the most beautiful piece of Hebrew poetry ever written, and it was that was said by none other than Charles Spurgeon, one of the greatest preachers of all time. Now, the Psalms are very interesting because they are songs. They were set to music, and they were given to the music director of the children of Israel, and they were set to song, and they were meant as worship songs, the way we do worship songs today, like I Surrender All and, uh, and stuff like that. Caroline's just come in. So there's a way to read the Psalms. You don't read the Psalms like you read the rest of the Bible. The Bible is split up into different kinds of narratives, different kinds of literature. For example, there's history, which tells you the unfolding of a life of an individual, the unfolding of the life of Israel, the history of Israel, the Gospels talk about the life of Jesus, and the book of Acts talks about the things that the apostles did after Jesus ascended into heaven. There's, then there's teaching. There's teaching uh, passages, which you'll find in the epistles and up to the book of Revelation. Then there's the wisdom literature, and the wisdom literature would be something like Proverbs, where Solomon gives advice in different aspects of life and in different situations. Then you have prophecy, which are predictions and sayings right from the mouth of God brought through a human channel as the spirit leads. But the Psalms are definitely poetry. The Psalms are art. And that's how they have to be approached is as a work of art. So as we read Psalm 19, I would like you to just relax. I'm going to read it very slowly. And as I read, see if images come to your mind, because those images that come to your mind as I read it, uh, will help you to answer the questions that are coming. These The questions are not easy because the questions can't be answered just by looking at the scripture and trying to extract the answer from the scripture. The answers tonight will have to come from your heart. They'll have to come from what you imagine in your mind and what you feel in your heart as the scriptures is read. And the Psalms were made for meditation. They weren't meant to be just read through and then put your Bible aside. They were meant to linger, linger over every verse, linger over every word, Think about what it means. Think about how it applies to your life. And take your time as you read the psalm. And that's what we're going to do tonight. So I'm going to read Psalm 19 all the way through. And then we're going to break it down piece by piece. I started off by putting this beautiful image of the solar system and the galaxy before we start, because the psalm starts off with that premise. So here's Psalm 19, a psalm of David given to the chief musician. And I will tell you who the chief musician is a little later. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a, a tabernacle for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. It's rising is from one end of the heaven and its circuit to the other end, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is pure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, 
yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless, and I shall be innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Now you see the way I divided these verses. I divided them with a space in between, and I guess I left that there because it's deliberate. Each verse is supposed to be meditated on, thought about very, very thoroughly. And uh, so we're going to do that starting right now with verse 1 as we look again at Psalm 19. The law of the Lord is certainly a treasure. And that's what this psalm is all about. Now, the chief musician actually refers to the Lord himself. I did not know that. As I was studying the psalm today, I found that out, that any time it says to the chief musician, it refers to the Lord himself who was represented by the head of the music department of the nation of Israel. So whoever the worship leader was, or the head of the music department was, that man represented the chief musician, the Lord. The verses that are parallel to verses 1 to 3 are in Romans chapter 1, verse 18. You'll notice here that verses 1 to 3 talk about the heavens declaring the glory of God and the firmament showing his handiwork. And down here in Romans 1, verses 18... And 19, it says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifested in them, for God has shown it to them. It's kind of the same theme. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things which are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. Now, this psalm, as I said, is considered one of the most beautiful examples of Hebrew pro poetry, and it's full, full of meaningful images. So we're going to begin to break it down. Here we go. Psalm 19. We're going to take our time over each section, and we're going to give it a lot of good thought, and let's see what kind of answers you come up with. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. So the qu first question is that the attributes of God are seen in creation. What do you think are some of the attributes of God that we see in creation? I'm going to start with Mark. What are some of the attributes of God that we see in creation, just by looking at creation? Well, we see beauty in creation. There we are. There's one. Uh, we see order in creation. Definitely order, yep. Yeah. Okay, that's good, Mark. Uh, we see beauty and we see order. Let's go to Christina. What do we see in creation that would tell you something about the character and attributes of God, Christina? Um, well, looking at Daisy over here, I, oh. I just remembered um, that really great um, analogy of how dogs teach us about the forgiveness of God, oh. how they're very quick how they're very, very quick to forget that they've done wrong. And oh, okay. they forgive us so quickly of like, we're mad at them. And yeah, so yeah, that, that, that's something. Oh, okay. So, uh, so through a dog, you find out that they're very forgiving, which is the way we should be very forgiving and immediately put offenses aside and restore the relationship. Well, I've had uh, five dogs in my lifetime. And what I learned from dogs was devotion and love, no matter what. They're always devoted to you. They keep coming back for more. They never get tired of you. They're always happy to see you. And for me, that communicates how I should feel about the Lord. I should feel like, like my dog does to me. I should feel that way towards the Lord. What about, you, what about you, Brother Jeffrey? What do you see in creation that would reveal to you the attributes of God? Um, I think creation teaches us that as we examine it, that there has to be, not so much about dogs, um, there has to be like a God, a creator behind creation because it is so complicated, so complex. Okay. That the more we learn, it's more we have to discover. Okay, so when you look at creation, the creation of the Lord, you see complexity, 
and I see detail, a lot of detail. It's incredible, really, when you think of it, when you go down to the simplest flower, to the largest galaxy, it's put together in such a way that every detail is seen. And in fact, when you read about the statistics, when you read about the, uh, the, the, the way that the universe is set up for life, it's particularly human life, and that everything has to be exact. And if it's off, even by a fraction, there, no life could live on Earth. It's absolutely amazing to think of. And uh, I realize that uh, there is no way, no way in the world that that could be put together by, uh, by a process of random chance. So we're on Psalm 19, for those of you that have just joined us. And as I was saying, Psalm, the Psalms are written in such a way that we meditate over every verse. So right now we're on verse one. The attributes of God are seen in creation. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. Another question I have is, what do you say to someone who attributes their destiny to the universe. I don't know if you've ever heard somebody say, oh, I thank the universe for my good fortune. Oh, the universe is not on my side because things are going bad. What do you think, Valerie? What would you say to somebody who says, my life is controlled by the universe? What is the universe for this person? That's a good question. What is the universe? Well, it would be the stars, the planets, you know, the galaxies. I know it's... Who, who has created the universe and galaxies? Yeah, I know who has created the universe, but what's amazing to me is that the attributes of God are given to the universe. God is yeah. all-knowing. The universe is all-knowing. I guess because people don't know the universe, we, we cannot even, it's too too big to, to you, just like God, actually. You know, you cannot imagine God somehow uh, Yeah. because it's too perfect. It's too big. It's, okay. it's infinite. Right. So universe is infinite too. So maybe that's why the people are just gathering that together i don't know well i guess they look up in the sky and they see all this grandeur and they figure there's got to be some kind of life directing power in that which there isn't at all and uh, just for the quick story my dad used to work long long time ago when he was not retired he was working in france for the uh, how do you call that an, an observatoire you know the astronomic observatory yes, yes. and hold yes and when he was talking to the people doing the research over there the uh uh, astrophysicians, people like that, they were all saying at the end that they all came to the point that they were believers because oh. with what they were saying there, they were all saying it, it can be. It can be that there is nothing beyond that, nothing okay. about that. It's just like, yeah. All right, that's amazing. great. And uh, finally, Caroline, what would you say to someone who says, oh, the universe gave me my husband. The universe gave me good fortune. <laughs> the universe opened up the door for me to good, get a good job. What would you say? Caroline. I say that, uh, you know, that's obviously something that they can choose to believe in. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, who do they go to when they're in trouble? Okay. The universe is there to help them. Yeah. You know, so who do you call out to when if you're in drowning water, are you going to call out to the universe or are you going to call out to God? That's a good question. Uh, in my case, when somebody tells me about the, the universe guiding them, I tell them, well, the, uh, you'll have to explain to me how the universe acquired a mind, how the universe acquired a will, how the universe has direction, how the universe accounts for every single individual life that has ever existed on the face of the earth and has put a plan together that, that unfolds the life of each one. And that's where they realize that believing in the universe rather than God is a little bit on the ridiculous side. Okay, so let's move on to the next verse and the next questions. Here just, it is. A, just a quick comment. Yeah. I would, I would be thinking more along the lines of people with that kind of uh, philosophy uh, on life, thinking that things are random. I'm part of a, um, an act of a random event. And so there is no personal anything in between. Yeah. I know some people think and that. that. And that's, those are the people who believe in fate. Yeah, they believe in fate. That's true. Which again, we come down to the same thing. Fate is impersonal and they, they can't really explain what fate is and how it works. Okay. Verse two says day unto day, utter speech and night unto night reveals knowledge. This is a tough question. Why did David compare the day to speech, which would be revelation? And why does he uh, compare the night to knowledge? Whoops. I'm sorry. I have it backwards. Oh boy, let me just change that for a second. Where's the R? Here it is. Okay, why did David compare the day to speech? In other words, the day speaks. 
And why did he compare night to knowledge? The night gives revelation. That's a tough one. We'll have to think about that. You have to be a little bit poetic to get the answers to that. Justin, what do you think? Um, can you put it back on the board, please? Just so I can see. Yeah, uh, sure. The day utters speech, from my yeah. understanding. Um, oof, that's uh, It's not easy. The, the, you have to understand, this is very poetic. You have to think like a poet and not like a, an engineer. The answer is not in the verse. The answer is poetic. There's a beauty in it. So what do you think David meant by the day speaks? What does the day speak of? Um, I guess the day is where you see life, where you see uh, things going on. Um, I guess it's where it speaks into uh, the thing. Things move usually more through the day. The day, the night is more where people uh, sleep, where people are more, uh, I guess, when people are awake. So the day utter speech, they're just speaking. Uh, night unto night reveals the knowledge. Uh, I guess because it, it, it could possibly t uh, tie into the scripture where um, at night you dream. So sometimes you get, you could possibly get revelation through, through dreams and, um, and through day you get visions right okay. from that scripture. So possibly that. Okay. Let's see what uh, Christina Brooks has to say. Day unto day utters speech and night unto night utters, uh, uh, reveals knowledge. What do you think, Christina? from a poetic standpoint? Um, I did a little research online and it says the revelation of God in nature continues every moment of every day, every day and every night, like an ever flowing stream, nature pours out its message about God. The poetic language of this verse suggests that every day delivers a message about the creator and every night conveys knowledge about God's glory. That's good. I also you. thought about the dreams too. So he just said that. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that's great. Thank you very much. That's, that's exactly what David meant. Don't forget, David was a poet and a musician, as well as a king and a warrior. Then he says, there is no speech, speaking about the revelation of God now, there is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. What voice is that? Well, the voice of God through his creation. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. So, Tom, do you think the word... The world has adequately been exposed to the revelation of God's truth. Because yes. even, okay, can you tell me how? Tell me how this verse is unfolding today. Well, the, I'm thinking of Romans 1, where Paul tells us that uh, the creation is exposed to everyone. Right. So everyone knows. Uh, they know God is there, but they hate God. And... But but they know. I mean, you you, it's inevitable. You you look at creation and you, you, you if you're saying it's the universe, I mean, <laughs> there's there's obviously something wrong when you think about it. Yeah. Okay, that's a good answer. All right. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. Its rising is from one end of the heaven and its circuit to the other end, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. Now, when I read that, the bridegroom coming out of his chamber, I thought about the scripture verse of the bridegroom uh, relating to Jesus coming back at the end of time, which I have a, an artist depiction here of the Lord coming back at the end of time. So how is the rising of the sun, dawn, comparable to the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ? I'll give that one to Oliver. Pearson, what are you doing? Well, the, the rising of the sun or the dawn means, uh, means that that is when the Lord is going to show his glory right. through, the, through the love of Jesus Christ who's going to come into the world, which is when Jesus comes to the world, he, he shows all the attributes of God. He shows the love, shows the patience, he loves the, he shows the power, shows the joy, he shows the faithfulness. He, 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 he contains all the attributes that are in um, 1 Corinthians 13 that are described. And he, and he exposes that. And that's 
that's very similar to um to the the rising of the sun okay what about you john how is the rising of the sun comparable to the return of jesus at the end of the world john cardos <coughs> Oops. John, turn out turn on your mic. Well, he's there, but he I guess he can't hear me. How about you, brother Jeffrey? Yes, I can hear you. I can hear you. Okay. Hear you. okay. <laughs> All right. So tell me how the rising of the sun at dawn is like the Lord Jesus Christ returning at the end of time. Very simple, I think. Uh, I think everybody can see the the rising of the sun. Right. It's it, it, it shines on everything, right? So it, everybody can tell that the sun has risen. The same thing will happen with the Lord. Everybody will see Him. Every eye shall see Him. Yeah, yeah. That's it. Okay, that's great. That's a good answer, and that's what this artist depiction shows you: that when the Lord returns, every eye will see Him. Now we get into some really great thoughts. The law of the Lord is perfect converting the soul the testimony of the lord is sure making wise the simple so the question from that is the observance of the the observance of the law under the new covenant i'm sorry that's not right should be old covenant there we are the observance of the of the law under the old covenant was the pathway to righteousness but how does the law affect conversion under the new covenant caroline how does the law affect conversion in the new covenant? Under the old covenant, we have to observe it, but how does it work in the new covenant, the law? Um, well, it's perfect in the sense that with the old covenant, you you had to keep doing sacrifices. You had to, to keep shedding blood uh, of uh, pure, innocent animals. Whereas under the new covenant, one sacrifice was enough. So it, because Jesus was perfect and sinless. Okay, but how, how is the law applied to somebody under the new covenant? Hello? Yeah, Caroline, go ahead. Sorry, it's cutting off. Oh, I can still hear you. Okay. Uh, so, sorry, can you say that again? Because it cut off when you asked me the second question. Okay, the question is, how does the law, how is the law applied to the heart in the new covenant? Because well, the, Christ has written his law in our hearts. That's it. Christ and, has, uh, okay. Yeah, so when the law is written in our hearts, it means that we have a new nature, which was inaccessible to us under the old covenant. So the law still converts the soul. Because when the Spirit of God comes to live in us, the laws of God are written in our hearts, and we receive a heart of flesh rather than a heart of stone. The next question is, how does the testimonies or the proverbs of the Lord make the simple wise? Sister Bev, how do the testimonies of the Lord make us wise? Uh, that one is tough. I think by studying this, studying the word of God, and uh, you will really um, understand what he's trying to tell us. So I think that's where we're going to get all our, um, all our vision from and, and all the meaning of, of his coming or his returning. Okay. That's, so, what, that's what I'm thinking, yeah. So the testimony of the Lord make us wise and they, they prevent us from making stupid decisions. Yeah. Now we get to the statutes. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart, and the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Now the statutes of the Lord are his foundational truths. What are they and how do they bring joy? So I'm going to give this one to Mark. Mark, what are the foundational truths of the Lord with regarding to human life? I think Mark is um, <clears throat> Yeah. Okay, well, outside of the commandments, uh, we can think of, uh, you know, loving the Lord, our God, with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our, That's why and our neighbor, like ourselves. So, um, if those are considered statutes, yeah, they those are. are, yeah. Uh, what was the second part of the question? So, uh, the, uh, how do they make us, why do they make us rejoice? The foundational truths make us rejoice. Why? Well, because we know his law is perfect. 
Right. So basically, we rejoice in his truth, right. which is perfect. Okay. And that should uh, radiate out of our lives. All right. So the foundational truths of the Lord help us to rejoice. And uh, Gerhard, how is the word a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path? Uh, because it sets us on the way the creator of the universe wants us to go. Yeah, okay. So it gives us direction, right? Yep. This, this one's for Tom. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever, and the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. So, Tom, what is the fear of the Lord, and how does it keep us clean? What is the fear of the Lord, and how does it keep us clean? Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Right. So it's uh, it, it's a good thing. It's a good thing that God gives us that the fear and and it's it's clean. And um, what was the second part? How does the how does the uh, oh boy, my mind has gone blank on me. Just a mind second, too. I have to go back. Just a second. Oh yeah, how does the fear of the Lord keep us clean? Uh, well, it keeps us clean because we. Uh, we, we want to uh, please him. Right. We want to please him, and uh, it's impossible for us to do it, but he gives us the ability to do it. Okay, so the fear of the Lord, we respect the Lord, we love the Lord, we honor the Lord, and we delight in obeying him, and we thank God that he gives us the grace to be able to, to hear him. Now, when does God execute judgment, Caroline? Oh, is Caroline, can she hear me? Caroline, can you hear me? No, I don't think she can. Eh? Yeah, I hear you now. Okay, so when does the Lord execute judgment on his people? Judgment and chastisement would be synonymous in this case. It wouldn't be the final judgment. Well, the Lord is, uh, first of all, gracious and patient. And so he usually allows us time to repent and gives us that space and he speaks to us and speaks to us again and again and then and when in his knowledge all perfect knowledge he uh determines that we have a heart that is not gonna turn back to him um then in his timing he gives that uh that judgment to us okay john carlos what about you when does the lord execute judgment on his people uh he executes judgment, I think, when uh, when he when he knows that we're in danger to to uh, end up in a very bad place where where he can no longer help us, and so he has to get more severe with us because he does get severe. Otherwise, we wouldn't obey him. You yeah, know, yeah. I mean, we obey him out of love, but we can easily fall out of that if we don't repent all the time. You know, so yeah. he he wants to urge us to repent. Basically, most of the time we sin. We sin because we, you know, your your sin that so easily besets you. He talks about that, you know. Yeah. And 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 so so when we, in order to keep us away from sin, because he, uh, the, the evil one, we have an enemy, and the evil one can get get to us when we don't uh, when we don't walk the right path, when we when when we sin and we don't repent. So I think that's when he calls a judgment. Mind you, it says in the Bible that there is a sin unto death. And he's not talking about spiritual death, I think, there. I think, I think he's talking about, like, when the Lord takes you out. You're, you're oh, just like Ananias and Sapphira. They got taken out. Otherwise, they would have, uh, they would have uh, uh, soiled the church, you know? Well, so, you know I, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, I'm, I'm, I think. I was going to say, Ananias and Sapphira are a good example of God executing, executing judgment on hypocrisy in particular. And yeah. a lot of people think they weren't saved, but I don't buy that. I think they were saved, but they were. I think so, too. Yeah. I think they just, uh, they made a terrible mistake and a, a mistake that couldn't be tolerated in the church in its early stages, even though now, if God were striking people dead for hypocrisy, <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I wouldn't yeah. want to think of what would happen. <laughs> yeah. All right, John, that's good enough. Thank you very much. Let's go back to the uh, scripture. Okay. More to be desired are they than gold. Yea, than much, uh, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey in the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, 
and in keeping them, there is great reward. So some of, what are some of the rewards of obeying the word of God or fo- in, in our case, following Jesus? All right, let's see now. Joseph, what are some of the rewards of keeping the Lord's word or following Jesus? You there, Joseph? Uh, yep. Okay, so what are some of the rewards of being a Christian? That's really what the question is. I guess uh, being... Uh, or benefits. Benefits would be good, too. Yeah. Being being able to um, make uh, the right uh, decisions, being able to um, to forgive. Oh, okay. Uh, even at the hardest uh, of situations that we might uh, uh, encounter or have to go through. Um, knowing also uh, being um, able to to grasp um, and to ask the Lord, what do I do in this kind of, at, and at this time and this kind of situation? Therefore, um, I think I think it um, it will be sim- simpler to say that um, you will be uh, like um, full of wisdom. Okay. What about you, Oliver? Um, what are some of the rewards of following Jesus? Well, um, be more love, to be more like Him, to have to have love, and um, to have a shoulder to lean on at all times. To be able to pray to Almighty God and to be comforted, to always be inhabited by the Holy Spirit. To be shown what we should do, to know what we should do or what we shouldn't do, and um, to always have His mercy and His grace upon us. Okay. It's very comforting. All right. I and look at friends. sorry. No, it's okay. I look at it this way: that I'll never be an alcoholic. I'll never be a drug addict. I'll never be a sex addict. I'll never become so mentally ill that I won't be able to function. I won't be a pessimist. I'll be an optimist instead. I'll have peace. I'll be, I'll have control over my anger and control over some of my negative emotions. I mean, there's so many things I could, that, that are a reward and are a blessing for following Christ. I can hardly keep them all in track. So that's the way I look at it anyways, is there, there's many things that I've avoided because I've been a Christian. Now, some people think I'm crazy, but we'll see in the end who has the last laugh because I, I hate to put it that way because I wouldn't laugh at people's destruction, but we'll see in the end who comes out uh, better, the believer or the unbeliever, because there are so many things that God has done in my life. I can hardly keep count. And for me, there are benefits of following Jesus. And finally, Valerie, what are some of the benefits of being a Christian for you? Well, you said a lot of it. I mean, I'm getting rid of the anger. Yeah. Being in peace. Yeah. Uh, getting rid of anxiety. Yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, as Oliver said, not feeling alone. Yeah, that's a big one. Yeah. Okay. Especially nowadays. I mean, in the situation we're right now, I mean, I think that if I was not a Christian, working alone in my basement all day long, not seeing everybody, I would get completely cuckoo. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> I was okay. not a believer. <laughs> and I'm not the only one. And I'm lucky enough to have a bigger house and I have kids, etc. But for people who are really alone, I cannot imagine how it is now. Okay. I think iPhone is Alexa. So Alexa, you can go in and contribute something. What What are some of the rewards and benefits of following Jesus for you? Hi, Pastor. Hello. Good to hear you. Thank you. <clears throat> you also. Excuse me. Well, first off, you know, his forgiveness... Um, you know, his divine favor, authority yeah. to have dominion over all of the things over this earth, um, you know, and being able to spend everlasting life with him in heaven uh, and hearing all of the kingdom of God. Well, so you know, and like you said, the, li- the list goes on. <laughs> yeah, the list goes on is right. When I look at yeah. Alexa's posts and I see her videos, there's one thing that stands out all the time. I've never seen her depressed. She's always happy and joyful. The joy of the (laughs) Lord is her strength, to say the least. I know some of you don't know who she is, but uh, trust me, Alexa is one person who's full of joy, full of joy. 
Oh, hallelujah. I don't know if you knew, but praise God, that's my middle name, you know, and I didn't always rock that, but you know, his grace is sufficient and, you know, his forgiveness and guidance and just the Holy Spirit's, you know, um, direction is a blessing. And I do want to join many more. So thank you for having me when I oh, pop in, any, but anytime, but next time, yeah. let me know it's you. Cause I don't know who iPhone is iPhone could be anybody. <laughs> Sorry. I didn't even know. I didn't know. It doesn't show my face, but yes, yeah, sir. It's you just, got it. You got it, it says iPhone. <laughs> well, if no, if iPhone comes back <laughs> up, I'll know it's you. All right. Let's get back to the Psalm, Psalm 19. See, I hope that I'm making the point that you cannot read the Psalms quickly. You've got to work your way through the Psalms. Think about every passage. Think about every verse. Meditate on every verse. And they have a tremendous effect on you. They really do. They, they have such a transformative effect that it, you can't even measure it. Now we get into teachings on sin, where David says, who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless, and I shall be innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Now, there are four things you can learn about sin in this concluding passage, and I've numbered them. One, two, three, four. So I'm going to read them each, and then I'm going to ask you if you can tell me what they are. One, who can understand his errors? Two, cleanse me from secret faults. Three, then I shall be blameless and I shall be innocent of great transgression. Four, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. So let's start from with one. Who can understand his errors? What do we learn about sin in that one, Caroline? Who can understand his errors? Is that uh, sometimes we need God to even reveal to us? um the things that we have uh the faults that we have like it even makes me think of the scripture that says why uh look at the the splint in your brother's eye when you have a log in your own eye so sometimes we don't even understand ourselves yeah. uh the errors of our way and god has to first point it to us and bible says that the heart is deceived oh. so that's that's how i understand that scripture i don't know Sorry. if it's right yeah, the heart is deceitful above all things. Can you imagine that? Above all things, the most deceitful thing in creation is your heart. Wow. I wonder sometimes if he means more deceptive than the, the devil. I'll have to give some thought to that. But anyway, the heart is deceitful above all things. Who can understand it? And that's the point that David was making in that part one. Part two, cleanse me from secret faults, Tom. Cleanse me from secret faults. What do we learn there, Tom? Uh, I think he's speaking about... Uh sins that we continuously commit uh with our minds okay so you're talking about besetting sins sins that recur over and over and over again yeah or or uh, just maybe just like being upset with somebody mentally or whatever is going on in our minds okay our, our, our secret sins our hidden sins okay so you're saying that god can see into areas that normal that even we can't see maybe yeah, he could, going back to what Caroline said, that uh, maybe God needs to reveal some things to us. Uh, I guess it's kind of hard to hide from the living God, eh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. What about you, Jeffrey? Cleanse me from secret sins. What does that tell you? Um, sins that is known only to the person okay. and to the Lord. I see. You know? Um, like you know, most of the time, I haven't really met anyone online personally for many months, really. So, no one really knows what I'm, what I'm up to, but, yeah. but God knows what I'm up to, and so it's that relationship that we have between God and ourselves. We have to be truthful and honest before God, even when no one else sees us. Okay, I'm surprised nobody said that only God can cleanse us that uh, David is asking the Lord to cleanse him from secret sin because he realizes that he has no power whatsoever within himself to make that change. So he turns to God and he says, cleanse me from secret sins. Then he says in part three, then I shall be blameless and I shall be innocent of the great transgression. So Justin, what do you think of that one? What do we learn about sin? Then I shall be blameless. 
Well, uh, it's it's the once he's cleanses us from all our sins, well, we're just uh, we're righteous. Uh, it's his righteousness that is uh, revealed uh, through us. Okay. So we're 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 clean. He's cleansed us from all our sins. All right. And Mark, what do you think about that one? Number yeah, three. I concur with that. It's the conclusion of the previous verse. Yeah, it really is. Because if you're asking God to cleanse you of your sins and he complies and he cleanses you of your sins, then you know that you'll, you'll be innocent of great transgression. Tom, what's the great transgression? What's the ultimate sin in the heart of every man? <clears throat> unbelief. Yeah, Christ. unbelief. Yeah. John Cardos, what's the great transgression? The great transgression, yeah. I believe, in this, in this passage... Yeah, I think it's Psalm 51, most of this. Uh, it's, it's a great transgression. He says, Clean, cleanse me of secret sins. Cleanse me of presumptuous sins. Yeah. Okay, if we cleanse those, those things, those little, what, what appear to be not great things, then you will, you will not progress to, do, to doing something that's a great transgression. That's the way I see that passage. Okay. So when I think of great transgression, I think of original sin the way that we acquired a sin nature, which was passed on through the genes from Adam all the way down to us, that we're all born with a sin nature. As David said, in sin did my mother conceive me. So if the Lord yeah. cleanses me and I'm innocent before him and I'm blameless, it means that I will not com commit the great transgression, which in my mind is totally being hostile to God, not wanting him in my life, not listening to him and having a sin nature, which is contrary to his word, and contrary to his precepts, which is which is interesting because David has just spent a whole big part of the psalm talking about the law of the Lord and the testimonies of the Lord and the statues of the Lord and how wonderful they are. And then he talks about his sin in comparison. And so in order for him to, to agree that the law of the Lord is good and the testimonies of the Lord are sure, making the why simple, he has to be cleansed. Otherwise, without being cleansed, he would never agree that the law of the Lord is good. He would say the law of the Lord is oppressive. The, the testimonies of the Lord are a burden. The foundational truths of the Lord are a pain. So that's what the sin nature is all about. And finally, we'll finish it off with the last segment, part four. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. So what do we learn about that? I'll give this one to Christina Brooks. Can you put it on the screen again? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Sorry. Yep. Just give me a second. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Well, I started praying for God to guard my tongue and my mouth and to only speak words of edification and encouragement to others, and to not speak foolish things and to always meditate on his word because when we we can when we keep our focus on him and his word he keeps us in perfect peace yeah and when we're in the word and we know his will then we will walk in obedience to him and make him happy <laughs> okay well that's he gives good us the strength and has redeemed us from that's, sin and death and hell that's perfect i like that because someone who has understood his errors someone who has been cleansed of their secret faults someone who has been kept back from presumptuous sins by the grace of God, someone who has been declared blameless and is innocent of the great transgression is going to speak words of glory, words of grace, words of love, words of patience, words that, uh, that demonstrate the, the heart and the mind of God. And that's why the words of his mouth and the meditation of his heart will be acceptable because Jesus said, out of the heart, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And when you've got Jesus in your life, It'll be shown by the words that you say, because the words that you say reveal what is in your heart. And that's it for this. That's it for this week. I'm going to ask Caroline to close in prayer. Caroline. Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you, Lord, for the, the words that you penned through your servant, David. Let them be forever written in our hearts. Let them resurface at the times where we need them and let there be a greater understanding of them lord as we've even seen tonight just by spending some time we have already gathered so much 
as a body. And I pray you continue to reveal even more um, to us individually when we have our, our private time with you, Lord. Thank you for causing your people to be filled with joy, filled with faith. And I pray, Lord, that our very lifestyle would be such a testimony to others that even if we said nothing, that they would be affected, Lord, when we are close to them. Every time we go to the grocery store, every time we, we walk elsewhere, oh God, that you would just use us. Thank you, Father, for causing your sons and your daughters to be known and revealed to this world, Lord, so that your name can be glorified. And as we walk out in boldness and faith, Lord, I pray that we would see the signs and the wonders even that would follow us just as you did, Lord, just as we read about in so many of the, the chapters in your word. So we thank you, Lord, that you are not a God that changes. So we pray, Lord, that you would continue to do this work in our hearts, bring us to the point where you can use us in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Mark, you wanted to say something before we go? No. <laughs> oh, I see your hand is raised. I don't know what that was for. No, it was probably like this. Oh, okay. All right. Good night, everybody. Thanks a lot. Good night. See you next night. Bye. Bye. God bless you. Bye. Thanks good for coming. Night. Bye. 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 B